Okay, great. So welcome everyone and thanks for joining us um, for the August um, Kanawha County HIV Task Force uh, meeting. Again, I'm Suzanne Wilson. I am the director of the Division of STD, HIV, Hepatitis, and Tuberculosis um, at the Bureau for Public Health. And um, I'll start us off today um, with an epi update. Uh, just give me just a second to get the... Slides pulled up. Okay, can you guys see the slides? Yes. Yes. Yes, Susan. I see you. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so um, the current outbreak data um, reflects an increase of seven new cases uh, or seven new HIV diagnoses from the last time we met in June, um, bringing the total. Um, for the outbreak up to 113. Um, two of the new cases were actually diagnosed in 2021, um, but were only recently located and able to be definitively associated with injection drug use. Uh, four of the new cases were diagnosed in the hospital setting, and the other three were diagnosed by the CMC Ron White Clinic or their outreach testing. Currently, 14 of the 19 HIV cases that have been identified um, in 2022 in Kanawha County have been confirmed to be associated with injection drug use. Um, and just as a reminder, um, as we do every month, <laughs> this, is, this data um, represents residents of Kanawha County um, or those individuals who report being homeless in Kanawha County at the time of their HIV diagnosis. Um, so the epidemiology of the outbreak cases um, remains the same at this point. Um, there's still slightly more male cases than female. Um, currently, 80% of the cases are between uh, 20 and 40 years of age. 54% of cases uh, report being homeless or unstably housed in the past 12 months. And 92% of the cases are co-infected with hepatitis C. Um, hospitals remain the setting where the largest number of cases have been identified at 43%. Um, and of the eight cases that um, are deceased, um, seven are, were not related, seven of those deaths are not related to their HIV status. And there's one, we have one case where the cause of death is still pending. Um, looking at the medical status um, for the Kanawha County outbreak cases, most categories continue moving in a positive direction. Um, the number of individuals that have ever been linked to care at some point um, has increased by eight over the last two months uh, from 91 to 99, um, with seven of those eight individuals being linked to care within 30 days of their diagnosis. Um, as always, our goal is for individuals to be virally suppressed to protect their own health and prevent the spread of disease, and that category has increased um, by two individuals um, since June. Um, so just a reminder, you can find statewide data by county um, on our HIV Aware West Virginia webpage. Um, and then there's also information on testing and care resources as well as training opportunities um, and um, lots of other information um, on our website. So does anyone have any questions um, about the, the data? Hello, Susan. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Eschenauer. Quick question on what your predictions are based upon the trends that we have been seeing. Um, so I'm going to um, flip back to the epi curve here. So, um, you know, we have, um, I, I would say, you know, over the last several quarters, we've seen a little bit of a leveling off. Um, of cases, which is which is good and is hopeful. Um, you know, there is still um, there's always more work to do, but there is um, there is a significant amount of testing occurring um, in in several areas um, throughout the county. So, um, you know, we're hopeful for that. Um, we're hopeful 
that that's a trend that's going to continue, um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm gonna end that and stop. Okay, did I get it off? Oh yeah, there's not, I don't think it's sharing anymore. <laughs> um, okay, and um, as that was, you had great timing there, Dr. Eschenauer, as, as we um, move, um, before we move on to some partner updates, I did want to take the opportunity to um, introduce um, Dr. Stephen Eschenauer, who is the um, new health officer um, at the Canal Charleston Health Department. Um, and he's, um, we're really glad he was able, he's able to join us today. And um, Dr. Eschenauer, I don't know if you had any um, comments you wanted to make or anything you wanted to um, say. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. It's uh, a pleasure to join the group. And as we all know that HIV is a significant issue for our society, especially among those uh, with injectable drug use and the concomitants of hepatitis C diagnosis with HIV, how important it is to try to track down as many of these people as possible and get them engaged, engaged as patients so that we can get them treated um, one of my biggest concerns probably for our community is our continued outreach, that it, it's going to be a constant struggle to uh, not only find some of these patients, but to get them engaged enough to continue care. One of my big concerns is the number that have been continuing in uh, HIV treatment engagement that, that uh, Suzanne, as we had spoke about before, uh, I am all ears on what recommendations we can do to get as many individuals involved and engaged in their care and treatment. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, hopefully this will, um, if you've not had the chance already, this meeting will give you the chance to meet some of um, some of the really uh, crucial community partners that are um, currently um, Tackle, trying to tackle a lot of the, a lot of those issues and and those activities. So um, I think it'll um, I think we'll it'll be a great um, great partnership. Um, I'd also like to take a couple uh, a minute to introduce um, Doug. Oh, there you are. I thought you uh, I, I couldn't find your name, Doug. I thought uh oh he he took off, but um, Doug Beasley, who is also um, the um, a new face from Canal Charleston Health Department um, with us today. Then, and Doug is the um, director of operations at um, Canal Charleston. So, I wanted to um, introduce him and um, give him a chance. Doug, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to share or not. Uh, I appreciate it, Suzanne. Uh, basically, right now, I'm just trying to take everything in uh, <laughs> to be able to uh, help everyone with it. In any manner that we can to uh, to fight this, and uh, yeah, I think uh, we've got a good team. It's just we got to get the ducks in a row to, as uh, Dr. Eschenar said, to find these people and engage them and get them to stay engaged, which I know is the most difficult part. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Okay. So moving on to um, some other partner updates. Um, Christine, um, I see, I just happened to see your name first. So <laughs> do you want to, you want to sure. start? Hey, um, hey everyone. I'm Christine Teague. I'm the director of the Ron White, um, um, Part C program here in Charleston. And we're the primary HIV provider, um, in this area and are currently, um, trying to, uh, engage and, uh, work with just, just about everybody involved in the outbreak. Um, and we have over the last two years, especially, um, put a lot of effort and resources and personnel, um, into, into this, um, this very vexing, uh, issue and have worked extensively with our community partners, um, many of you who are on the line today with um, Health Department and Cassie Province with Covenant House and um, others that uh, work with the state and West Virginia Health Right 
Um, you know, literally, we are out there every day meeting people and trying to um, get them um, tested and linked to care and staying in care. And it has been, um, it's an ongoing battle. Um, we have um, been successful in acquiring some additional other, other grant fund funds outside of Rhyme White through um, other foundations that will allow us to do more. Um, our funding historically has only been for HIV care um, and high risk testing and linkage, but we now have the ability to do more in terms of PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis and um, addiction care services. So that is, is forthcoming. Um, you know, Dr. Eschner was mentioning how the, you know, the issue in, in trying to engage and keep people linked in, in care is, is really, it's very difficult when people are literally living, um, you know, um, under bridges, behind dumpsters, uh, who are in active, the active throes of addiction, where really our priority is getting people safely housed and into addiction recovery um, resources. Until those things are really addressed, the HIV care is becomes, it's lower, you know, when you know, the main, main priority is just survival. Um, so a lot of our folks, as well as the folks from our other organizations, are doing just that to try to reach people, develop relationships, and get them linked to those um, vital resources. So we're doing the best that we can, but we still have, you know, there are lots of people that are out there that, you know, 25% of the people in the outbreak we've had absolutely no contact with. Um, and then 25% are engaged, virally suppressed, and everyone else is somewhere in the middle. They're struggling. And we continue to, you know, to try to get them to to be able to have access to meds, get their labs. Uh, but there's there's many challenges associated with that, from transportation to just from virtue of being unstably housed, keeping up with possessions, including medications, to take medications on a daily basis is is challenging. We're looking into long acting injectables for both treatment and prevention, but the, those also have logistical issues with requiring people to be, um, you know, undetectable before they get on to injectable treatment. And with PrEP, um, they have to have lab tests, you know, regular phlebotomy lab draws before um, those injections are given, as well as regular follow-up. Um, so it, it, while it seems good in theory, sometimes it's difficult to put into practice. Um, really, the key is, again, making relationships and getting them engaged to housing and um, addiction recovery. Um, we are working closely with uh, other agencies that are out on the ground, um, Health, West Virginia Health Right, Cabin Creek Health Systems, where either we are working in conjunction with them on the street on our mobile units to provide care, or we're developing protocols where if our partner agencies see some of our patients out, um, in the community, what do they need to do in terms of labs? What do they need to do in terms of communicating with us that they've seen patients? So all that um, is in play. And then lastly, um, we've done a lot of work in our um, hospital emergency department and in, in, in the inpatient setting to try to um, increase our ability to, to make sure that people who have risk factors that come through the emergency department are tested. And there have been it, lots of issues with that, but we have developed and now there is a hospital um, process protocol that's been put into play um, that uh, there is a process for screening and for um, immediate linkage to one of our Ron White uh, staff that's in the hospital. And we're in the process of trying to automate that all, all of that so that it just automatically happens when they come in and they, they um, have those risk factors. Um, so we're getting there and we're also trying to make sure that people who are in the hospital, that they reach out to us to make sure that there's more um, of a seamless transition between outpatient and to, or inpatient to outpatient. Historically, uh, you know, we in the Ryan White program may never have known if somebody uh, was in the hospital with an HIV diagnosis or there for something else, but there's somebody that we were looking for. Um, so we're trying to increase that process so that it, it creates another opportunity for us to engage with the patients while they're um, in the hospital setting. So 
um, all that continues, that work continues, and um, I'm hopeful, like um, Suzanne said, that maybe we are, you know, the numbers are have plateaued some. I hope that that will continue, and I hope that maybe that does reflect some of the hard work um, that we've all been doing these past two years to um, to work with, with the folks, but we, we do have a long road ahead, I think, and the fact now that we're getting ready to create a state plan for the elimination of HIV and Hep C, um, that'll give us some additional um, tools to work with and a plan um, to move forward in the, in the coming years. I'm kind of, I've kind of droned on, but I did want to have this opportunity to kind of to let the, the folks on the call that are new um, to this uh, task force to really kind of talk about what we're doing in the field. Sometimes, you know, we, don't, we do it quietly, um, but we're, we're out there every day. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Christine. Does anyone um, have any questions for Christine? I don't have any questions, but I'd like to piggyback off of her since we do so much together, if you don't care. <laughs> sure, go right ahead. So like Christine was saying, our uh, housing is a huge part in getting um, our people into care. And we can we can say that we can house them easily because i do have we do have funds and i have the program i've run the hopper program here at covenant house but i also run it in 22 uh, or 21 other counties so it's not just right here in canal county and it's it, we have one case manager assistant and now i have secured a peer support person for all this and it's a whole lot and our um our population that we're we're dealing with aren't the easiest to get housed like when we say they need housing and treatment they have to have almost have to have the treatment before i can get them housed because we're running out landlords i mean i can get you housed but if you're not trying to at least a little bit be sober it's really hard to keep these people housed um even in our highest level of housing support done through the um, HUD, I mean, we're we're getting people's getting kicked out left and right. So and just rehousing them and trying to find a, a situation where they can actually stay would be a whole lot easier if we had um, more access to, of course, treatments and, like she said, transportation to treatments is one of our biggest barriers. It's it's insane um, how many people fall out of their sobriety because they can't get to the methadone clinic at five o'clock in the morning. You know what I mean? It's 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 bad. Um, some of the things that, like Christine just said, working with this subcommittee that we're going to do, I'm hoping to see some amazing things come out of it. Um, we need some working groups for testing, for linkage to care, for medication. I mean, for housing, for for just treatment alone, to really get. A plan. I mean, we we all know what we want to do, and we all and we, uh, the community partners that Christine talked about. We talk every day, and we know exactly what we're all doing. But it's just like everyone else. Um, it's we need pretty much everyone on on the same board. Um, I'm very happy to see that the um, health department's back and 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 joining us on these meetings and got new leaders and new people coming in. I'm I'm very I'm looking forward to seeing y'all's plans and y'all's actions too. Um, worked very close with Dr. Young and I felt like we made a a good leeway when the CDC was here before. It's like since the the federal CDC kind of jumped out, we've all went different directions doing COVID stuff and then everything else and we're still trying to keep our feet under us but it it kind of kind of departed us a little bit i would say um the testing like christine says we are getting places um we just know that there's a higher rate of people not being tested that's not directly in charleston than what we're getting to so like the campbell's creek area that just flooded horribly we have a known at least five or six um positives up there that aren't in care so we're, i'm really hoping to get up there and maybe the floods will give me a little bit in to help them get into some housing or something because these people live in campers up there you know what i mean and it, it's that bad and then we got people new people in rand and new people in cedar grove and i mean it's going up up or down the the county pretty quickly i would I, I would say we still have um, known people in Cabin Creek that's not in care and just knowing these areas and how the drug use is so bad. I know there's we know that there's a lot of people we're missing. Um, still, Kathy, can I, mean, I just can I just add on to that? Um, yeah. 
we have, you know, we're pretty much the community partners that I've been, that we've all talked about um, are really in Charleston. Um, and those outlying areas that Cassie mentioned, you know, Eastern Kanawha County, Campbell's Creek, Marmette, Rand, um, that, that's really untapped. Um, and anything that we can do, I mean, we've gone out on our mobile unit to try to go into those areas. And one of the things that I've learned very quickly um, over the last two years is that because historically we have only been funded for, for HIV care and prevention, people know us as that. So um, we can't do it alone. We have to be, um, we have to work with other, other agencies and we can kind of go under that cover um, to, to do our work. Um, so when I say, you know, uh, other agents like with the, you know, the FQHCs or the health department or health right or uh, food distributions, the United Way, um, we tag along with those folks and do our thing and it's not, it makes it less conspicuous um, what we're there for. So um, that that's, had, has been one of my asks is that, you know, can we develop some sort of outreach um, uh, initiative to those areas outside of Charleston, the Eastern Kanawha County that might involve the health department or um, and, and Cabin Creek. And so I'd like to see that happen at some point in some fashion. Um, we go to St. Albans one day a month um, to work with pe folks that are in, that go to the uh, soup kitchen there um, and are high risk, very high risk. We've not had a positive there, but it's been surprising. Um, so we do have somewhat of a presence in, in St. Albans, but Eastern Kanawha County, I think, is really an area that um, needs some attention. And, and just and that's basically what I was saying. I know that we we're doing what we can here, and and I feel like we are doing a good job. I mean, the 113 news. Um, we know that there's a few more than that because they don't have two tests. You know what I mean? So they can, so the DHHR can't count that. The state can't count that. But Christine knows the health right. We all know that there's quite a few more than that because they wouldn't take two tests. Um, so it's just, I'm just excited to get these subcommittees started and get some things actually rolling in. Um, one thing I, t I was telling people before is that when the DIS came, they, we find these people and y'all do your little things and, and you know, you go one to your next person, but these people are Ryan Whites and our clients forever. You know what I mean? So that's 113 new clients that I, that I have to keep housed for their duration. So the less we can get, <laughs> the the easier it would be for me. But at the same time, um, we're we're looking for funding sources, of course, just to get more people to um to even apply for the Hopple program to even have it, like in the southern part of West Virginia and a couple other places. Like I have twenty two counties because there's no one else doing it. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's not something simple, and but we're we're getting it done, and I I look forward to meeting y'all. Great, thank you, Cassie. Does anybody have any questions for Cassie around um, housing? I don't really have anyone about housing, but uh, prior to this job, I was 30 years law enforcement with the Kanawha County Sheriff's Office. Eastern Kanawha County, as we name it, is an animal of its own. Um, it's spread out. Most people uh, do not take well to strangers. Um, they don't, uh, so I definitely think that, yeah, it, it's going to be a battle, uh, getting these people to come forward. Uh, it's going to take accessing community leaders, people that they trust. And it's, uh, you know, as we all know, Rand is a little, little bit easier, but once you get into Cabin Creek, Cedar Grove, Kelly's Creek, uh, Paint Creek, all those areas are so spread out. It, it, it's going to be a difficult, uh, battle but like you said with the partners if we can you know get some insiders up there that can form a relationship that's going to be our i think one of our best efforts uh is is you know trying to locate where they're at and getting them engaged 
I think one thing that um, Ron White and we do pretty well is um, get our rapport with these people. So if we get to go back like they do in St. Albans, like we did when we were doing it um, last summer everywhere, Canal City was a real hard group up there for a while. But these people come knocking on our doors now. Um, they call my phone every day. Our, up there like in like he's just at cabin Creek, it is very hard and they're so spread out and you have to go to Paula's and you have to do these things me and i don't know if brooke parker's on here i can't see everyone on here but she's the ryan white foot on the ground social worker amazing um literally backpacks sometimes and i know it sounds crazy but testing out your backpacks is really where we get it done because they trust us i mean i'm from cabin creek so i mean i do have a little rapport with a bunch of people up there but they they trust us pretty quickly i mean we can go into campbell's creek and get people to test on the side of the road just because we can we know how to talk to people um the the problem is getting the amount of people that we need to go with this or the amount of spreading it out maybe you know two people here two people there and just keep going um we get contacts every day from our clients people different people they've used with different people that they think that they have come in contact with since they've had hiv and like i don't even know who to tell right now like i mean i get names and, and birthdays and i can look them up on my thing and like I get a few um i got a few last week and i was just like i don't even know who to call right now and and tell this to like who do we need because we need to start looking for these people too i know that the the sum of not my job but it is my job because like i said these people are going to be my my clients forever so i'd like to find them as soon as possible and, and see um but just knowing that we we have a, a good group behind us again and really trying to get some stuff done will hopefully help us out and then if y'all can spare some people to come out with us we would be very happy to let them tag along well i don't think we'll have a problem there i think uh from some of the conversations me and dr eschenauer and i have uh, you know we want to get boots on the ground and we want to be proactive more proactive than reactive to this and actually uh it's just been a a changeover process here is me and him are both new trying to learn things uh so we were at least we're always open for suggestions we're always open for communications uh these these type of meetings are great but it's, sometimes it's the one-on-one -on -one conversations where we just sit down and hey this is what we got to do and we try to get it done so Yeah, that's great. And I will um, I'll make sure to get um, you guys connected, Christine and, and Cassie, especially and other partners as we go through. I'll be sure to get you guys connected with Doug, um, send you his contact information so that um, you guys can have that um, direct communication. Thank you, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, Rhonda, I see you're on from Health Right. Do you have any updates? Sorry, I'm multitasking as I'm working with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. So I, I'm just, um, I can um, concur on what Christine and Cassie both said. I mean, we all work really well together. I don't, um, as they always say, it takes a village to get it done. And I feel like the more partners that we have together, the more we can get done out there. Um, and we've always worked really well with the health department um, for years. We've been a big partner with them. And I do feel like it does take the trust. I mean, anywhere we're going, it takes trust with our patients um, to get them to test. A lot of times when we go, because they know HealthRight offers other services, as Christine said, then they're more prone to come up because, you know, now that we have the medical mobile unit, we're doing primary care on there as well. Um, and you can take it more privately as into um, the exam room to, you know, and I mean, we've done wound care out there um, recently. Um, we, we did have a little guy come in um, a few weeks ago, and Christine will know about this, um, actually came in looking for PrEP and had been on PrEP um, previously, but had been off of it for a year. And uh, we did his HIV test and it was positive. Um, 22 years old, so he uh, had to get the big tarvey instead. So um, Christine was so excellent to help get him in the same day. So um, that's why these partnerships work really well. We actually, he didn't go anywhere. We got him in to be seen the very same day and got him on the medication that he needed. 
it's so important. Um, yeah, I, I can't say how many times. I mean, we, we couldn't do it without our partners um, because there's there's so much that goes on and there's such a high need now with other things as well. Not only COVID, you know, we're also uh, dealing with the other thing right now, the monkeypox vaccine as well. So um, we're trying to work that into our world as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, in the fall, we're going to we can get out there. And so as Cassie said, when we're out there, we're offering vaccines and other stuff. So sometimes people come over and talk about that. And when we're at Covenant House, you know, we've got primary care right there. If Cassie's there, she can take somebody in immediately um, to see the provider and get them taken care of, which is very nice that we have that little clinic there. Um, same thing on the west side. We have a driver who transports people. Transportation is a huge issue, um, getting them where they need to be. And of course, he's the only one person, and um, we, we try to get them um, in treatment the same day or get them back and forth, but it is hard um, because if they can't get somewhere, they're not going to go, um, and they fall out of care. Um, so we're, we're still out there testing big. Um, we had in July, we tested 138 for HIV on outreach. Um, all unduplicated. So I thought that was pretty good. And that was all Kanawha County. Um, so we're out there on the west side three days a week um, at, by the smokehouse. That seems to be a big area right now um, for us. And of course, you know, we're at Covenant House and then we're over there at Manna Mill. We've actually gotten some new people coming into Manna Mill that we're seeing that we're testing. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're ready to hit the ground running for the fall. So, um, boosters and uh, vaccines and all that lovely stuff on top of uh, HIV testing and Hep C testing. So um, we're, we're ready to do whatever we need to do as well. All right, great. Thank you, Rhonda. Does anybody have any questions um, for Rhonda? Uh, the only question I have is we keep coming back to transportation. What, what have I mean? I've not been a part of this group in the past, so I'm not sure what is the what could we do or what can we try to do to help with transportation? Is it a just of having a person and a vehicle available to do it? Is it uh, bus passes? Is it you know, what can we do or what can we try to do or look into do to help with that situation? Um, and it just from experience, if you don't care for me to go um bus passes are great i mean i have bus passes and i run out every month to, and i just give them to to my clients um transportation when needed is the problem so it's pretty much we get these people right then and there or we lose them so yeah i have like i have a peer support person we're working with me now on the days that i don't already have her taking seven to eight people where they need to go she'll drop everything she's doing and, and come and take somebody um but i'm also we're, we're still trying and that's just a person in a car um we've tried uh ubers with certain people with certain organizations that's kind of messed up because it's confidentiality they pretty much almost automatically know if i call that the person has hiv because my role um they all same thing with ryan white you know so if we could get a designated i don't know person to be able to to feel <laughs> to, to try to figure all that out that would be great um from treatment to housing appointments to ryan white care appointments to health right um harm reduction i mean we have to get them to every one of these places if we don't they don't go so it's like i mean we spend out of the three four case managers between us and well and Ryan White, we spend half of our time just driving people around. It would be great to have a designated vehicle that would be, you know, nondescript, that, that certainly didn't have any identifying logo that has anything to do with um, HIV or addiction or, you know, that type of thing. Um, and I almost have like somebody that would be on call um, for transportation. And early, you know, if, if you mentioned the 5 a.m. methadone clinic, um, you know, we were we were trying to do some of that for a while, and that was just not sustainable. Um, taxis are, you know, they're notoriously unreliable. 
um, Medicaid transportation also just the amount of the arranging that has to go along with that is almost impossible for this population. Um, so I don't know how that would work, but um, you know, having a designated driver in a designated vehicle would be ideal. Okay. And I've always said we're not that far apart. You know, what I mean, like it shouldn't take that much. But where some of these people are, there's there's just no buses, no working. But I mean, up Campbell's Creek, up in Sissonville, and all these places, there's just no buses. There's there's just no other way. So it's like it might be a thirty minute drive. You know, what I mean, there and back. But if they can't get it, they won't do it. So. Right. Okay. Well, that's helpful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Is there a this is is there a way to possibly contract with the taxi service to provide that service? It might be more reliable. I know that different places have had contracts with the taxi services before, but where their their drivers are contracted, if they don't want to come out, they don't have to. So, and if it's a five o'clock in the morning thing and they don't make it, you know, then yeah. Then they just don't make it. And once you let our the, this clientele, once you let them down a couple times, that's all you get. You don't you don't get a couple more times. Okay, great. Um, I see uh, Tina. I see you're on. Do you have any? updates you'd like to provide hello this is actually my name is allison oh. foster i'm a community <laughs> health worker but i work with tina and <laughs> okay, she great. has overbooked herself today so i'm just <laughs> setting in for her okay um great thanks allison do you mind just telling um doug and dr eschenauer kind of like who what organization you guys are with and yeah, um, we are we are under Marshall Health, but we are Great Rivers Regional System for Addiction Care, and we do work um, in Kanawha, Cabell, Wayne, Putnam. Um, the really the only update that I have right now is um, in the next couple of weeks we are starting HIV um, testing. Um, with the Putnam QRT. So we are going to be able to start testing more in Putnam. Okay, great. Thank you. This is Joe Deegan from Thomas Health. Mm -hmm. um, Dan, Dan Lawfer had been uh, our CEO and been very much involved with uh connectivity with the with uh with the hiv task force um so he he retired in april when wvu came on board and i'm actually uh sending an email as we speak um letting uh some of our uh, new administrators know that this group is meeting we had been in discussions when dan was with us <clears throat> with christine and um about you know, syringe service programming and and other and other types of things that we could work collaboratively on, and uh, I'm hoping that we will be able to continue those conversations. Um, but right now, we're trying to find who's. I'm trying to find who's the person at our um, administration that will be um, my channel. You know, for information about HIV, we provide a lot of you know treatment services at the Addiction Healing Center in downtown Charleston at St. Francis. And we have folks uh, that are recovery coaches that go out with the quick response teams, both for Kanawha County and for the city. So, um, but uh, we're hoping to, you know, get more uh, connected uh, moving forward. All right, great, thank you.
Um, looking through the list, I think that's everyone. Is there anyone I missed or um, anything anybody else um, would like to share with the group? No. Okay, well, um, thank you everyone um, again for um, joining us today. I think this was, um, I think it's a great opportunity. I'm excited for um, sort of a, um, I don't want to call it a new start, but a, a, a restart. How about that? We'll call it a, um, a restart um, with the new leadership um, at uh, Canal Charleston and um, excited for um, seeing um, what what this group can continue the the amazing things this group will continue to do um, so as I said I will make sure to send um, everyone on the meeting today um, Doug's um, contact information so that you can um, be able to contact him directly to um, um, arrange communications and, and discussions and and things like that for um, stuff moving forward. And um, if nobody has anything else, thanks for your time today. And um, we'll talk to everyone, if not before, next month. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.